Welcome to This Week in Venture Capital. It's actually our 21st edition, which is mind-boggling. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I can't believe it. That's nearly half a year, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, today I have with me Mark Jeffrey. I'm sure everybody knows the CEO of This Weekend. And today I'm going to interview you on why you took the job. Oh, no, really? I'm no, no, just I'm... kidding. <laughs> no, we. <laughs> I'm just trying to throw you for a loop. No, the discussion today is a venture capital Q and A yep. session. Uh, so we've got a number of topics. Uh, we're going to take questions in a moment from uh, viewers, and I'm going to promise to answer at least ten questions. So please stick around and answer, a ask questions, and I will answer them. But I'm going to start with uh, one topic. Uh, before we get to Q&A, that seems to have taken over the blogosphere this week in venture capital land, our small leash, uh, niche where we all love to talk uh, amongst ourselves about what's going on. And the topic is convertible debt versus equity. Right. And I'm going to describe those things in a moment. But you've done startups before. I have, actually. I've done, I've done let's see. Uh, depending on how you count them, four. Four. And so, were you involved in any of those in, as the primary fundraiser? Uh, twice I was, yes. So I've actually taken convertible debt before. So you I have. have some, I have some uh, understanding of that. What yes. What drove the decision for you, convertible debt versus equity? Um, it, well, it's very quick. So you can get a convert. You can get a convertible debt deal can go down very quickly for mm -hmm. you. Um, there's not the overhead of all the paperwork and the legal and all that stuff. Um, it was in style when I did it, in the yeah. Valley especially. It was, yeah. was like around 99, like right before the crash. So I don't know if that says anything about convertible debt. It does. Yeah. <laughs> it says a lot. <laughs> but it definitely was like right around that time frame. Good. Um, well, I'm going to discuss the issue. And in doing so, I'm going to do an honest discussion of the issue. Because the easy thing for me as a venture capitalist to do is to tell everybody what they want to hear. Yeah. And I think, because I spend a lot of time both on blogs reading comments, I spend time on products like Quora, uh, I spend time kind of reading on Twitter what people are saying on topics, and I get a sense, and, and you know, hacker news or whatever, we all on the internet sort of live in communities where people reinforce our views. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an entrepreneur's view on a lot of topics that they get a lot of reinforcement about what's right and what's likely to happen in the future that isn't correct. And I just want to give you just one random example and then come back to this topic of convertible debt. You and I have both been around for a while. Uh, you remember we used to call it the new economy, like the, everybody was saying it's the new economy. Yep. There's a new way of doing things. The long boom. The, that, long, the boom. long boom. Yeah. The old rules don't apply. Yes. And having been through three cycles now, and I'm on my third major time-compressed internet cycle, um, you know, I've come to be a little bit more circumspect when people say the whole rules have changed. So if you look at the internet overall, some things have really changed. The cost structures have changed where you can distribute books and video and music and clothing and shoes and everything else without having a physical infrastructure, uh, a retail store. Yep. Uh, so the costs have dramatically changed, but how you value businesses, really kind of the old rules apply. How fast are you growing? How profitable is your business? How big is your market? Yep. You know, and what does the ultimate competitive landscape look like? And ultimately, it really just comes down to growth and profit, ultimately. And so, you know, People said there was a new economy. Of course, there wasn't, although there are new technologies that are making people more productive. People are now saying that there's a new market for funding and that venture capital is dead and everything's going to be angels and super angels. And I see very smart people, and I don't want to name them, and very accomplished people saying the old rules of equity financing are dead. The future is all going to be entrepreneur friendly because the power is in the hands of entrepreneurs now. And it's so cheap to create a business and you can scale it so fast. Venture capital or capital in general is just a commodity. And uh, the old rules don't apply. So in the future, you can have unpriced convertible debt as fast as you want from super angels. We don't have to deal with these wanker venture capitalists anymore. Right. And 
I could tell people what they want to hear, but it's just not true. Well, I think the, the main driving force behind that argument is that it is cheaper to start a business now. Yeah. And I think that, that has changed. That is yeah. actually a material thing that's changed. Yes. You don't have to, you know, the cost of the infrastructure build out, cloud computing, all that kind of thing. Yeah. The, the costs are very different now to yes. get up and running. So. Yes. I, and I agree wholeheartedly with that argument. I've made that argument on my blog. Uh, talked about. I, I've talked about firsthand experience. I mean, my first company, we had to buy Oracle licenses, eighty thousand dollars. Right. Sun servers, we spent two hundred plus thousand dollars. Um, we had to buy the Solaris license, you know, <laughs> on top of that. Yeah. We had to have a web hosting platform that was really expensive and a management environment and software and configuration. I mean, we were in for, I want to say, at least eight hundred thousand dollars just to get up and running. Just to be up and running. And that, and today, that would cost almost zero. Uh, Ten thousand, maybe. I was going to say yeah. almost zero, yeah. right? Like, I can have Amazon Web Services, yep. virtual storage, vir virtual compute power, open source stack, you know, LAMP stack, yep. free database. Um, so yeah, the costs have changed. And I think the other thing that's perpetuating people's arguments are that you look at the growth of Zynga and you say, without a lot of capital, I can become a billion dollar revenue company. And the fallacy of that argument, Mark, is if you time the market perfectly like Zynga did, and you're riding, drafting off the back of Facebook and their explosive growth, I mean, Facebook's the phenomenon, and you're able to capture users very cheaply mm -hmm. in a channel where other people couldn't. And then once you have that scale, then you can outspend everybody else on marketing because your marketing costs right. are high relative you know, to other people, but you know what the lifetime value of your customers are. Yes. So you can outspend everybody else. So there's a fallacy that you can scale to Zynga-like size these days easily. Well, you can do it, but just a, not easily. Well, also they had Mark Pincus as the founder. Yeah. And he's done multiple successful companies, you know, one right after the other. And he's raised money, quote unquote, the old school way multiple yeah. times before. So All credit to Mark Pincus. I'm not taking anything away from him. He deserves all the credit for that. I'm only saying take Mark Pincus today trying to create a competitor to Zynga, if Zynga was someone else's company, I don't think he'd have a hope, no matter how talented he is. And I'm just saying certain markets, he drafted right behind Facebook's growth. Yep. Same thing happened to a lot of companies when iPhone announced. Yes. When the App Store opened, there were companies like Tapulus and other people who drafted off the success. Slide drafting off MySpace. Yeah, I awesome. mean, you know, you look at YouTube drafting off MySpace yep. and PhotoBucket drafting on MySpace. But I am completely off base from what I wanted to talk please, about. Please, please. Um, I could just, you know, <laughs> when, when I get guys like you who I know know these topics, we could just sit and have a chat, but that's probably not what viewers want. So let me go to 101 first. What is convertible debt? Convertible debt is literally debt, like a loan, mm -hmm. but you don't have to repay it, usually. The term convertible means that debt converts into equity in the future, so right. that's what convertible debt is. Convertible debt oftentimes has less rights for investors, and that's why people say it's quicker. We don't have to go agree all this stuff. Yep. It's a shorter form legal document, so people have historically said it's cheaper. And often, it has avoided the most contentious topic, which is price. Mm -hmm. The way it normally works, convertible debt, because the question is, when I convert, so when do I convert? Yep. And at what price? Right. The normal mechanism is you convert upon an equity financing round and you typically get a discount to that round, the norm is about 25%. Yep. So, you know, if somebody else is gonna, you know, do a $5 million pre-money valuation in equity later, and you had put $100,000 in convertible debt up front, you're gonna convert at a $5 million price minus a 25% discount, right. that's the way it works. But you have no idea what that valuation is going to be in advance. As an investor. Yes, as well, an investor. Well, I guess neither party either, does. Yeah, sure. neither, neither party does. So let's talk about why convertible debt is used. It's used in two scenarios, and I want to talk about both. I'm going to take the less discussed scenario first so I can take it off the table. If you have two VCs, 
any amount of VCs, but let's say two, who have invested in your company in equity. They've put $5 million into your company. And you are going to raise $10 million in your next round. And you haven't quite hit your milestones. And you haven't quite hit the proof points. Or the markets are pretty negative. Um, and you think you're going to get to an equity round, but you're not ready. But you need to continue funding the company. Typically, insiders will give you convertible debt instead of pricing it. That is called a bridge loan. Yes. And the term is called bridge loan because it's supposed to bridge you until an equity financing. Yep. I have said to uh, entrepreneurs, just make sure your investors give you a bridge and not a peer. And what does that mean? Oftentimes, what I call a peer loan is you know realistically you need six months to get to a proof point or nine months or whatever your time frame is. And let's say for six months you need $800,000. And they say, well, we'll give you $200,000. That'll fund you six weeks. And let's see if you can ship product or hire the guy you said you were going to or sign up those new customers or whatever. Six weeks come and go. And they say, okay. Or the, two months, let's say, come and go. Yep. And they say, okay, here's another 200000 and the reason I call that a peer is it's never long enough to bridge you. Right. And as an entrepreneur, you end up changing your behavior because you just never know. So how do you go recruit a senior person out of Facebook or Google or YouTube or anywhere? Catch 22. You don't want to recruit someone because you don't really know if you're going to get to the other yeah. side. How do you sign up a customer and ask them for money not knowing if they're really going to go somewhere? So teams change their behavior, and I wish more investors understood that. I think as an investor, you ought to choose either to shut the company down, yeah. sell the company off, or frickin' bridge them. Yeah, right? yeah, because then you're at odds with the, with the entrepreneur. Because you're, you're basically, for every tranche that you get, the investor can't do anything. He here's, needs the money. Yeah, right? and so. here's, here's the, well, the, the, yeah, so the, the entrepreneur can't do anything. But here's what the, the thing that most VCs who haven't been entrepreneurs don't understand, I don't think. Some do, the best do, but yeah. many don't. The entrepreneur will look you in the eyes and say, 200, great. I mean, I wish we had more, but I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to make it work. That's fine. We'll get to the next milestone. Don't worry. And so the VC is thinking, wow, this is easy. I don't have to risk the 800000 and he's going to work just as hard. But I promise you, it affects the psyche. It affects yes. the decisions. It affects everything. And it affects the emotion. And so much of winning is about confidence and emotion and you know, going into something, feeling like you're going to achieve success. And I think it's the naivete of some investors. I would rather shut a company down than to peer financing. Yeah, no, I agree. Completely. Now, why do they do convertible debt is the question. Well, normally VCs like new VCs to do the next round of financing. And there's a reason. If I invested it in $8 million pre-money valuation, I put $2 million into your company. So it's $10 million post money. The math works like this. My $2 million divided by 10, the post money, means that I own 20%, okay? So eight million pre, two million invested, 10 million post. And uh, if I put that money in and the company's not performing as we thought, and so therefore you need more of my money, what happens is I've got investors who invested in my fund, they're called limited partners. Sure. And I don't want them to think I'm just in love with all my deals or I'm trying to protect my personal reputation. And maybe the next round should be priced at 5 million pre or 2 million pre. Maybe it should be priced at 20 million pre. Yep. I need an independent arbiter of valuation who's, who doesn't have existing money to protect, right. who's willing to set a price. And that price setting mechanism is very important to venture capitalists so they can say to their LPs, their limited partners, this is a fair price, an outsider invested at this price. And so it's easier for them to give you money as convertible debt to say, well, we'll just, we'll give you this money and it'll get a discount to the next round because then they haven't set price. Yeah. Okay. So that's the not discussed part of convertible debt. The big trend in convertible debt, the big discussion is about angel financing. And here's how it works is in booming markets. Well, let me, let me step back. I'm sorry. Let me say this convertible debt without a price set is hugely advantageous to the entrepreneur. Equity 
with a price set, I think is fairly balanced, but people could argue uh, is something an investor would want. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking VCs, I'm talking angels here. Yep. Now, let me make the argument for an investor in why they wouldn't want to do convertible debt at a 25% discount to the next round. Let's say I'm Ron Conway. You know if you get Ron, you're gonna get access to his network. You know you're gonna get the halo effect of Ron Conway. Yep. You know once he's in, he works his butt off. Everybody says it on your behalf. And let's say that I'm Ron Conway and I invest in convertible debt in your company. And so let's say that the real price of companies at your stage and your performance ought to be somewhere around $3 million pre-money and he put in a million dollars amongst he and his friends, $4 million post. But having Ron gives you a few things. Number one, you've now got a million dollars of runway where you're building stuff, accreting value on his nickel. Yep. He takes a high risk because you're not validated. He's first money in. But his risk is not being rewarded by pricing at an early stage. Number two, you want him to call all sorts of people, A-round investors, customers, helping you recruit people. Every time he helps you, He's hurting himself. Right. I was just going to bring this point up. Yeah. It's really weird because you are building money on his, or sorry, you're building a company on his dime. Yeah. But if you succeed, weirdly enough, that means your valuation goes up, so he gets less of the company. So it doesn't work for him. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know if he's changed his opinion, but he and I were on a panel together discussing the topic, and he said that's the reason he doesn't do convertible debt. <laughs> And no, but he used to do it, though. He used to do it back in the day. It's very possible, and he may have changed his point of view. I can tell you on this panel, he didn't. Um, but if I depersonalize it, think about any investor. Why should they give their money? The whole thesis of investing is the higher the risk, the higher the need for potential returns. Yeah. So that's why the first money comes in at a two, three, four million pre-money. Once you are the guilt group or Groupon or Facebook, or yeah. Zynga, there's so much value already proven in the company, of course you pay a higher price. So, convertible debt. I say to entrepreneurs, if you can get convertible debt with no cap, and we're gonna talk about a cap in a moment, from the exact same investor that you would want even on a priced round, then go for it. I still wanna explain that there is it's not as perfect as you think. I have a friend who raised convertible debt no cap from I'd say top 10 early stage, probably top three actually, early stage investors in the country. It's a deal I looked at, mm -hmm. I won't name it. And because it wasn't priced for whatever reason and when he went to raise the round that I looked at, they had a lot of Silicon Valley investors really excited about them willing to pay a high price and I considered it, we didn't end up doing the deal. And he was trying to thread a needle, which is, well, I want a high price, of course, but I don't wanna screw these guys who totally helped me. Right. And I've got all these angels who had an expectation that they were gonna get a fair price. And because, because it's become frothy, if I do this high price, they're gonna be unhappy. And in a way, I think you want each stage of your investors to be rewarded. Yeah. Oh, great. Can't you just up their uh, percentage of their discount, though? It's it's not that easy to do. The new money coming in will say... Why they get to, such a sweetheart deal. Exactly. Mm. And just because I'm willing to invest at a high price. So there are mechanisms. You can give them warrants, which is the equivalent of stock options. There yeah. are things you can do. In doing so, ultimately, it comes out of your pocket. Sure. So it's the same as having gotten a lower price earlier. I believe that what is fair is to have a price drown. What people have been doing lately is called convertible debt with a cap. A cap meaning a maximum. Mm -hmm. So I say I'm gonna raise a million dollars, convertible debt at a maximum price of five million post. Okay, so 20% of the company maximum. So this has become trendy. Now angel investors love it because they got their price. Sure. Yep. But here's what the investors get that you as an entrepreneur don't, and I don't know why people aren't talking about this. They get their max. There's no min. Mm. Interesting. So you've got your five million max. Most entrepreneurs, honestly, because this is the first time they've done it, they just don't think about it. They're like, I got convertible debt. Yeah, sure. And I'm like, no, it's got a cap. That's priced. Yeah. 
And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, good point, right? And I'm like, by the way, there's a max, there's no min. Yeah. So if the market <laughs> crashes or you don't deliver, you yeah. don't have a floor. Now, if you priced the round at a reasonable price, call it three or four pre, or your later stage, seven, eight, nine, ten pre, whatever, if you priced the round and you've got the money locked in, you know, you've got a floor set, you've got a fair price yeah. from which to prove yourself. Um, so I've been saying if you're so obsessed about convertible, which I think is really emotional rather than logical, then do convertible with a price. And what it would do is it would mean a little bit less control for investors. They don't necessarily take a board seat. They don't necessarily have certain rights associated with legal with, with a property equity financing. Um, the argument in favor of convertible debt one of the major things people talk about is legal fees. It's so much cheaper yeah. to do. Yes. But here's the reality. There have been innovations around equity, whether it was the Y Combinator open source equity term sheet, whether it is the Series AA, which I think is what Fred Wilson uses, um, whether it is the Founders Fund documents, um, I know GRP, we use a set of really lightweight documents to do seed investing. We just don't ask for the same rights. And it makes it really easy to do. I have been able to do most of my seed deals for about $5,000, which is what you will pay for convertible debt. Oh, that's fantastic. I did not Maximum know Maximum 10K. Now, it, it's predicated on two things. Every time I do it with a, with a lawyer, I say, I want to fix costs. Yep. I say to them this. I say, number one, I will share lawyers company will use the same guy I do. That requires a bit of trust. Yeah, that's a little odd. I've never heard of that. Requires so, a bit of trust. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you make sure that you get a fair deal as an entrepreneur when you're doing it that way? It's not easy. I will say this. I normally say to the entrepreneur, they will represent you. If I feel like something complicated comes up, I'll pay separate legal costs for that. But I know how to do these deals. I generally don't need legal advice. You do. Right. Um, so I normally say the company hires the counsel. I can rep myself on a deal like this. And what that, that law firm's not making a profit on you. They may not even, they may, may even be losing money. They're betting that you are gonna be a successful company and they've locked in your next five or six transactions. Or at a minimum, if it's not successful, you're a high potential individual, and you'll do your next company with them. So they are willing to do those kind of things. And the second thing I tell lawyers is, if anything non-standard pops up, like I decide to ask for something crazy, or there's some big legal issue that pops up, you can carve that out and charge us more. Got it, okay. So that's, that's how I think about this topic. Um, I think with these mechanisms, you can price it as equity. And I think it's a whole big red airing uh, stirred up by a bunch of people who want to make it sound like pricing around is unfair. I think it's fair. It's oh, by the way, sorry. One last point on this topic is people say I can do it faster because I don't have to have the price discussion, mm -hmm. or I can do it faster. I don't have to discuss how many board seats or whatever. You want to know that going in. I mean, if you have again equivalent of Ron Conway and eight other investors who come alongside him. You want to understand what their expectations are. Do they expect board seats? Do they expect to be able to vote in certain ways over time? Because you don't want to have a contentious group of investors who have different expectations than you do. Yep. You ought to have the maturity to have the discussion up front about what are the key issues. And frankly, if you don't see the world in the same way, you might want to be looking for different investors. It's going to be a problem anyway down the road. It is a frothy market for angel investing right now, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. It is a frothy market, so entrepreneurs are able to get better terms than they will in other times. Yep. I think that, my own view, I don't have a crystal ball. That'll last maximum till the end of 2010. Maybe it'll last an extra 12 or 18 months. Um, it's hard to predict timing. But these things ebb and flow. You talked about it up front. You raised in the late 90s. You could do anything in the late 90s. Yep. You could do anything in 2005. For a variety of factors in 2010, angels are really bullish. They just won in the deal. An example I gave on my blog is one of the companies that I angel invested in talked to another angel investor who after 15 minutes had never met the guy, did a conference call on the phone, 15 minutes in said, I'm, I love what you're doing, I'm in. 
Wow. That does not happen in a non-frothy no, market. No, it doesn't. That's my equivalent of the J.P. Morgan yeah, example, the shoeshine, the boy. shoeshine boy. Yeah. And he's like, how do you know when to call the market? Yeah. It's when someone will do 15 minutes into your phone call who doesn't know you, they're into your angel room. Yeah. On that topic, and I'm going to go to broader Q&A, and then I'll come back to my second topic later. Are there any questions on that topic that you're picking up? Um, let me look here real quickly. Um, let's see. So why egg asks, uh, let's see, another underappreciated downside of convertible notes, they are more complicated than they seem because all the scenarios are not usually specified in detail as the documents are not large enough. For example, what happens upon maturity? Uh, what does the stock look like upon conversion? And what happens if an acquisition occurs before Series A, et cetera, that sort of thing? So often the what happens on an acquisition, at least in anyone I've been involved with, yeah. is specified. Hmm, we care okay. about that. Yeah, I would think so. Um, <laughs> in terms of what are the terms associated with a future equity financing, normally that convertible debt has to accept what's negotiated at the next round of funding. Right. The question is, does it convert into that round? Normally it converts into its own class. So if your next round's an A, the convertible debt might convert into a series AA. It might convert into common. Sometimes it'll convert into that new sh class structure A. Right. Uh, but that's typically what happens. And the terms will be dictated by the person who comes in on the next round. And any terms that'll be in its own class has to be in that actual document to begin with. Got it. OK. Uh, while we're waiting for a couple more questions, I know you also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the current sort of war that's been brewing between the class of super angels and you know, the VCs. You know, I, and I do want to talk about this, and I'm happy to jump into it exactly right now. Um, but if there are any other questions, even more broadly, Mark, yep. um, I'm happy to take questions because I'm conscious that once I start on a topic, it takes 10 minutes. <laughs> it goes for a while, yeah. yeah I'll, keep, I'll keep you appraised. I'm watching the, the chat okay. room right now as, I, as we talk. Mm. So, so um, I see one up there right now from Frumpy. It says, Mark, are you concerned with exits and timelines to exit when investing? Okay. So on my blog, bothsidesofthetable.com, I wrote a post, posted it, two days ago or yesterday, with my views on the economic outlook. Now, I studied economics, I have an MBA, so I did a lot of macro, micro uh, statistics and everything, but I'm not an economist. Right. Although I will tell you, you know, they say there's only two professions where you can be paid and be wrong 100% of the time and continue to be paid, a weatherman and an economist. <laughs> yeah. um, but that said, um, I gave my views as a non-economist, but someone who's very interested in the market. And, you know, what? I, I have a bearish outlook for the next three years. Really? Maybe five. Now, why is that? I look at, and, and again, the very deep, I have a lot of charts and graphs on my blog that go through it for anyone who's interested in that. But I look at starting with employment. I think... Uh, a lot of economic behavior starts and ends with employment. Unemployment is high, and I believe it will continue to go up. Hmm. And 77% of the economy is driven by consumer spending. Yep. So consumer spending is tied to two factors. Am I employed at a decent wage? And how is my debt level? Yep. Uh, which I'll describe in a moment. The am I employed? Well, 10% of the economy in the country is not employed. Up to 25%, I think, of young people are not employed, which is a very high number. Yeah. You have two other types of employment. One is um, true unemployment. So when they quote unemployment figures, they strip out people who have not been looking for work recently. So if you stop looking for work, you're not included in the number. Um, if you take part-time work, you're not included in the number. Right. And yet you're not a real long-term productive earner. So when people look at the true unemployment figure, they say it's closer to 17%. I don't know what that exact number is. It's higher than 10. Sure. If you look at populous states, California has a very high unemployment number. I think it's 14.5% or something like that. Yep. You look at Michigan, it's north of 15%. And um, there's two other 
types of unemployment I should describe to people. One, which I talk about in the blog, is called structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is different than cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment says the economy tends to ebb and flow, and as it is going through a growth period, unemployment is lower. As it's going through a, a retraction, unemployment goes higher. Structural un unemployment are those jobs that, because of changes in technology, or changes in regulatory environment, or changes in global competition, are gone forever. Yep. And Andy Grove wrote a wonderful piece on this, for which I don't agree with everything he said, but very informative that he calls the 10x problem, which is because we outsourced all of our manufacturing to China, to Taiwan, to South Korea, to places overseas, we have lost the competitive dynamic for the next market that comes. So if you, he calls it a 10x because if you look at Apple, Apple employs 25,000 people in this country. They employ 250,000 people in their supply chain in China, right. mostly through a company called Foxconn. They produce iPads and other things. And if you add up, I think it's Intel and Apple and HP and a number of other players, and you stack them all up, those companies collectively, all aggregated together, including Google, are now less than Foxconn. And what he's saying is, because there, there's a famous economist called Ricardo, and Ricardo came up with a theory called um, comparative uh, advantage. You've heard of competitive advantage. He came up with comparative advantage. And comparative advantage says that jobs should flow to the places that are best suited to those jobs. Right. And we all win. It's this kind of zero-sum game. We all win, uh, not zero-sum game. We all win. And lower cost jobs ought to go to lower cost places with lower cost labor. And the intelligent, creative part of the market, high value part of the market, ought to stay in developed countries. Yep. So in a sense, that, that economic theory from I think the late 1800s is held till today. What Andy Grove is saying is, here's what we're missing. I, Andy Grove, was one of the founders of Intel, came from Fair, Fairchild, I think, yeah, to, Fairchild. to Intel. So like a doctor. And he became the CEO of Intel. And we created innovation in Silicon Valley and this ecosystem around us by being the dominant player in chipsets globally. But look at batteries. Batteries for electric vehicles, in his opinion, are the Intel of clean energy and of clean autos. And because we've given up consumer electronic manufacturing, and we don't do it in this country, we've lost the ability to produce those and to produce fuel cells and other things. And that whole ecosystem, he claims, is, is less likely to evolve around here. The other thing that's important for people to understand about structural unemployment, most people watching this show, I'm guessing 90% of them, including you and including me, are highly intelligent people capable of getting well-paying jobs as defined by your age and your stage and your geography. But we are all hurt if the middle class people who might work in manufacturing don't have jobs. Yeah, I agree. It's going to hurt all of us. Yep. And that's what structural unemployment is, is hurting and will continue to hurt. So I always say, very long answer to a short question, but it starts with unemployment. But the second thing you need to look at is the overhang of real estate problem that still exists in yes. this country is enormous. You had a huge uptick in people who for the first time missed a mortgage payment. Yep. They haven't bankrupted, they haven't foreclosed, they missed a mortgage payment. You still have banks that are holding X foreclosed property on their balance sheets, not wanting to flood the market with them and the government's encouraging them not to flood. As they do, that will depress price prices because you're putting more inventory on them. Sure. If you look at consumer debt, at the time of the depression, as a percent, debt as a percentage of income was about 45%. If you go into the 70s and 80s, debt as a percentage of income went up, and that's okay actually. The introduction of the credit card created a fluidity in our system that allows people to spend uh, initially responsibly. Right. But that 65% 
by 2007 was 138 percent. You cannot have an economy <laughs> yeah. with 138 percent debt to equity ratio. Thousand cards. So uh, David Brooks. I'm still uh, waiting for you to tell me why you're bullish on the economy. I said bearish. Oh, bearish. I'm sorry. I thought you said bullish. That's oh, no. why I was, I was like, okay. No. Oh, Then gosh, we're on the no, same no. page. Okay. Very good. So, Very good. so I'll just finish this last piece. Is David Brooks said that that's dropped to 122%. Bernanke came out and spoke last week. He's the chairman of the Fed. And he said the biggest problem in the economy right now, paradoxically, is that savings rate went from 4% to 6%, meaning people are saving more. Right. They have to. They owe money. Sure. Right, and so people are doing what's called deleveraging, reducing the amount of money they own. It's gone from 138 percent to 122. I couldn't find any online source to validate the 122, but let's assume it's come down. Um, ironically, the fact that people are doing what's good for the economy means they're spending less. Right. 77 percent of the economy is driven by spending. Yeah. And so when you look at this, it's actually maybe healthy for six, eight, 10 years from now, but it means there's gonna be some pain ahead, I think. Uh, I'm one person's opinion, obviously. Yeah. And what I like to say to people is we were at a 25 year cocktail party, drinking margaritas, Oh yes. not worried about it. You can, there is no hangover pill that says I can get it all behind me in a year and a half. Now there's a quick fix. That quick fix is called a, a Bloody Mary. <laughs> or. Or as we like to say, nip the hair of the dog that bit you, right? So in the morning, I can drink a Bloody Mary. So what is a Bloody Mary? I can throw huge amounts of money at stimulus. I can create programs for people to buy housing, cash for clunkers to buy cars. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do some of this. You're either Keynesian, which means you believe in stimulus, uh, or you're a fiscal conservative, which means you're not, generally speaking. Um, and smart people come on both sides of the argument. But no doubt that Bloody Mary just means eventually you're still going to suffer. Right. So. Okay. Um, so anyway, so my time horizon on investments is I'm looking for an exit in seven years, not two years. And so my consideration is, is it a capital efficient company run by a management team that wants to do this for seven years? And am I willing to write that next check even if they haven't changed the world? And I like to find people to sit around the table with me to write those checks together who, who see the world the way I do. Right. So if we hit another year like 2008, I don't want to be sitting across from an investor who's going to freak out on me. I want them to say, look, we okay, we're going to have to cut 15% of staff, but let's give them a million bucks and get them through this tough time. Yep. Okay. What other short question can I give a long answer to? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, there's a couple of uh, built up in the chat room. Uh, Nick Halstead asks... Uh, what generally comes with a convertible, I assume note, uh, i.e. non-exec slash advisory? I guess they're asking what sort of non or sorry, non, do they get an advisory role in the company? Are they, I'm not sure what he's asking exactly. Nick, if you want to clarify that uh, further down. I see a helpful. really good discussion going on that I'm only picking up part of it from Zalzali, Z-A-L-Z-A-L-L-Y, and Yeg and Kyle uh, Ellicott and, and a bunch of people. And they're talking about super angels. So let's maybe go to the sure. topic of super angels. Um, angel investing was an individual business done by high net worth individuals. Most people would write 15 to 20 checks, usually in the 50 to 100K level. Um, and they were pretty active in those. They, were, they would invest in areas they knew with people they knew. Um, I would say the first prominent super angel I don't even know what the frick the definition of a super angel is, but I would say it's probably Ron Conway. Yeah, I would think that would be the definition in my mind. And I always call Ron Conway the S&P 500. And it's a shorthand way of me saying that if you want to invest in how the public stock market's going to do by an index fund, the S&P 500, because you, know, you can buy the Wilshire 1000, uh, but the S&P 500 captures a broad diversity of the market. The problem with being a stock picker is if you pick 18 stocks and you're not fully diversified and the market does well but your 18 companies don't, you don't get to ride. Because Ron Conway is so respected and gets in every deal, any deal he wants to get yep. into, 
he's going to have a lot of companies that don't perform by definition. You can't invest in 100 companies and see 100 people do well. But Google's going to be in his portfolio. Yes. Twitter's going to be in his portfolio. Facebook's going to be in his I think Facebook's in his I portfolio. I think Facebook is too. And uh, so Ron Conway's S&P 500, and that strategy works. The challenge uh, is if you don't have the diversity and don't get in all the deals and you do too many, I think, and I know, um, l listen, I know some of my close friends who do this business who don't agree with this, and that's fine. I mean, you know, a nice, healthy debate I think is good. Um, I think the challenge is in the market we're in where someone, everyone's so excited about super angels, entrepreneurs all want to work with them so they're getting good deals. Google and Apple and everyone else is buying a ton of their companies so they're feeling really good. Is fine, except if the economy turns south, you're going to have a lot of investments on your hand. I like to say if you're at the craps table and you've got too many chips on the table, it's pretty hard to keep track of where your bets are. Yep. And if the economy turns south, you're going to have to deal with all that. And what it's going to require, and I think the best super angels are the ones who recognize that your next round of funding is pretty darn important. Getting to an M&A fine, but M&A ebbs and flows. It's not a permanent cycle. People who know how to get the next round funded are the best super angels, um, as well as people who know how to coach and mentor and everything else. And um, it brings up a couple points, which is in a negative economy, uh, what happens to investors is something called triage. Triage is, I look at all my portfolios, I go down the list, and I say, I can't back them all, yep. either with my management bandwidth or with my capital. Which ones are going to succeed, and we'll put wood behind, and we'll help them? Which ones do we need to find some sort of home for, and which ones do we got to call? And that is the business. Yep. It's hard to do triage on eight companies. It's unachievable to do triage on 50. Yeah. And so that brings up a How challenge. How do you even know enough about all those companies to make the decisions? You don't. Yeah. I know people will pretend they do, but you don't. You yeah. can't keep track of them all. Um, you'll know enough. But triage involves me looking at the eyes of the CEO saying, are we firing your co-founder? Yeah. Because we need to cut 40% out of the costs. Those are tough days. And they happen. And the, yeah. it's not, those aren't pretty days, but they happen. The other thing I, I would say is that if you're... So Brad Feld, probably <coughs> the VC I respect the most. Um, I like the way he thinks. Uh, I like how entrepreneur friendly he is. I like how open and transparent he is. I like the technical nature of what he invests in. Wrote a post on his blog today, and it's worth everyone reading. It's feld.com. And he talked about this super angel problem, which is, and he didn't address it in the way I do, <clears throat> but he talked about the toxic nature of some of these very vocal people, either entrepreneurs or super angels themselves, who are bad-mouthing VCs. And I don't say this because I'm a VC. I say this as someone who was an entrepreneur for nearly a decade. The skills of a super angel are to shepherd you to an exit or a financing. And if you fucking piss off VCs because you're a loud mouth and you know, say every VC's bad and they don't know what they're doing, you can be sure that when they have a choice of deals, I wouldn't want someone on my investor roster who's got a big middle finger up at venture capitalists because funding is about stages. Early stage is done by super angels. Yes. Your next round is done by A round investors and then B and then growth equity and then public markets. I mean, imagine this, one day you want an IPO, but You've got a loudmouth CEO who's saying how stupid uh, public capital markets are. Right. <laughs> how stupid. Sort of self-defeating. Yeah, the management funds are. And I think there's a really toxic nature. Now, it's easy to be populist because in saying VCs all suck, and we know that there's a lot of bad VCs, but sure. in saying they all suck and they're all bad and they all don't know a thing. And by the way, every term should be entrepreneur friendly. You align yourself with the uh, with the entrepreneurs, and you get a lot of deal flow. But I would argue, where does all that deal flow go? Right. Um, and I would say this, which is, if I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm choosing my investors, and I have a choice between a focused, pragmatic investor like Floodgate, Mike Maples, and Anne, I can never pronounce her last name. I don't know who that one is. Muria 
not sure. Miria Ku. I know I you're think. talking about, but I can't uh, remember. Uh, sure. Professor at Stanford. Floodgate doesn't do a whole lot of investing, but they're pretty active in the ones they do and very well respected by VCs. Uh, if you're taking money from Iden Senkut, if you're taking money from Jeff Clavier, if you're taking money from Chris Saka, if you're taking money from Keith Raboy, I finally figured out, I actually wrote Keith, and I said, every time I talk about you, I don't know how to pronounce your name, because it's R-A-B-O-I-S, which with having lived in France, I want to say Rabois, yeah. but it's Raboy, Keith hmm. Raboy. Um, Keith doesn't do a million investments, and he's on record on GigaOM as saying, I want to invest in companies that are VC backable because I want to invest in companies that want to change industries. And to do that, you need capital. Yes, you do. I'm not looking for quick flips. Um, and again, if I'm an entrepreneur, I want Keith Raboy on my board. I don't want someone sticking a big middle finger up at my next funding source. Yes. I can understand that. And I also want someone who, if we hit bad times, is going to stick by you. Is not only going to stick by me, yes, of course, but is going to have a roster of 12, 14, 20 investments. Or if they have 50 or 60, it's between two to three partners who are dividing them 18 to 20 apiece. Yeah. It's better to be a good citizen of the uh, ecosystem of venture capital than, than a contrarian. And someone yeah. makes trouble. So anyway, should I get off my soapbox? Well, I got another question for you. So they're, yeah. they're starting to build up a little bit. How does that sound to you, though? It sounds fair. Am I, I off think the it, mark? No, I don't. I don't think you're off the mark at all. I think basically the, the angel needs to be your uh, friend. The angel investor needs to be your, um, I would say consigliere. That's probably the wrong word. But, but basically someone who's looking out for your own interest. Ron Conway is very exemplary of this. He is friends with all of the uh, VCs up on Sand Hill Road and yeah. elsewhere. And he makes a point of and walking he, you around and, and introducing you to people. And he invests alongside them. Yes. And so he, he benefits at all stages of, of, the, of the venture cycle. So he is exemplary of, of, I think, what you're talking about. And that, that's the right way to do it. So there is a model out there. And I think you're right that some of these people who are you know, shouting about how bad VCs are, it's not good for anybody. You know at least what? The, and the you know what? Maybe I'll be right or maybe I'll be wrong, but if you're an entrepreneur, join, don't join the bandwagon. I see people on Twitter saying, you know, really awful stuff. Yeah. You don't Do, need. You don't need to be. You don't be. You don't need to be like that. You don't need to be that guy. People. People see it. Yeah. You know, it I, comes back and bites you. I privately called a friend of mine who. I really like and who's one of these kind of uh, controversial figures and willing to say whatever. And I just said, look, mate, like some other people can get away with it. Take the high road. Yep, no, I agree. What other All right, so we got a question for you here. Um, when approaching a super angel or angel funds, is it better to pitch your product and yourself or is it better to pitch your team and idea? Your product and yourself or your team and idea. Well, let me parse that. It is best to pitch your team Mm -hmm. uh, investors first and foremost invest in teams, and uh, it's best to then pitch your product and idea kind of collectively. Okay, so there's a hierarchy there. Yeah. Um, okay, um, let's see. Does the Ricardo theory apply to companies that have invested heavily in offshore proprietary development? Isn't there a greater risk? Well, first of all, let me say I think... Uh, I think Ricardo kind of is applying at a macroeconomic level and at big company, industrial, government level. As an individual, as a startup, I am very on record of saying I don't think you should do offshore development unless you are natively from that country. Uh, and even then, I think having people onshore makes more sense. And I never believe in early stage companies outsourcing and the difference is you can offshore with your own people right so uh, offshoring doesn't mean it's third party outsourcing means third party got it okay um so looking for another question here um uh does mark care to comment on the demand ipo now that the s1 has been out for a few weeks uh, I hope they do well. I guess that's about all you can say for right now. That's what I thought. Um, <laughs> so, 
Uh, let's see. We seem to be a little bit short on questions here. Good, because I've got some really quick stuff to cover, and then we'll probably wrap. I want to do a public service announcement. Uh, Mark, you and I talked about this before. I have a very close friend. I've been friends with him for uh, 13 years from the tech community in Boston. He's a former CEO of a digital media startup. Uh, he was a senior director at AOL in Europe. He's an MBA friend of mine. Um, and his children were kidnapped. And they were kidnapped by his wife. Wow. Uh, but he had legal custody in the United States, legal custody for his children. And uh, she obtained illegal passports and flew them out of the country and is holding them in Egypt. He's got Senator Kerry now uh, on his side, uh, issuing public statements. Uh, he appeared on, uh, uh, not Good Morning America, what's the other one? The Today Show this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and is getting good national coverage. I've set up a fund for him and I'm asking anyone who can spare $25, not more, $25 to consider whether they would help him. Read the whole story, make up your own mind. But the place where you can go, it's on a website called GoFundMe, which is a really interesting concept. I really like it. But it's http colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y yep. forward slash nor which is capital N, you have to do capital, capital N, O-O-R, capital R, A-M-S-A-Y. So it's forward slash Nor Ramsey, which are his two boys. And I've set up a fund because uh, he's up against legally this person who has access to tremendous capital resources that have drained him of everything that he's earned in his 40 years to try and recover his children. Um, so I have offers of people who are looking to potentially help us legally on a pro bono basis, but he's, he owes hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'm trying to raise $25,000 for him, uh, set up the site. It's only $25. If you feel good about it, contribute. If you don't, no, I won't arm twist anyone. Yep. I wanted to do that quick PSA. I see they're saying to wrap. Do you think we can get away with another five minutes? Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, five minutes is fine. Okay, so you tell me though if I need yeah, to stop. I'll, I'll let you know. I'm gonna race through three deals. Okay. Uh, and if someone else, um, not for this, irrespective of your political views, he's a guy you want on your side. Oh, sorry, I thought that was. I thought that was a question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, look, I want to quickly talk about three deals. One is Chartbeat. Chartbeat raised three million dollars in a Series A led by Index Ventures, Saul Klein, who uh, everyone who's in London tells me they love. He's maybe the Ron Conway of um, he and and um, it's Saul Klein and Robin Klein. Uh, I believe Robin's his father uh, are the Ron Conways of uh, London. So they invested, Ron Conway invested, Chris Saka invested through lowercase capital, Chris Dixon's founder collective invested. People always say Chris Dixon when they say founder collective, but there's actually a couple guys who run founder collective and it's not Chris. He's the most prominent uh, person there, but founder collective invested. O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures uh, invested. Freestyle Capital, which is Josh Felser invested. Betaworks invested, Jeff Clavier invested, and Jason wow. Kalkanis. Of course, Jason Kalkanis. This is uh, pretty much the who's who of early stage who can invest in something. I'm a user of Chartbeat. Love Chartbeat. I love Chartbeat. It's on the This Weekend sites, on the Mahalo sites, everywhere. The only thing it's not as good as I would like it to be is actionable insight. It gives me a very good view of who comes to my blog, from where did they come, uh, what content are they consuming. I don't run a website for profit, so it's more eye candy for me. Yeah. But as I think about, as someone who, if I did care about it, I'd want more actionable insight. But for where they're at in their company's development, phenomenal company, uh, I think they're smart to invest. Another company done this week was Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y. Uh, it doesn't list the founder, but I remember, I've met him. It's, I hope I don't say this wrong, Gagan Biani, I think is his name. Um, the million dollars came from Keith Raboy, who I can now say, Rick Thompson, uh, who else is of note up here, Jeremy Stoppelman, Naval Ravinkant, who's part of Angel List, uh, Josh Stileman, and Dave McClure. Um, they raised a million dollars. 
Gagan was a former TechCrunch employee. He's not only smart, but he's earnest. Um, you, you get that sense in meeting with him. I'm more circumspect about this. I want to see him succeed, but I have seen so many comp. What what the tool does? So Chartbeat is analytics yeah, for websites. I didn't actually say it, but Udemy is. Um, you can go online and create your own education courses okay. and instruction, and then people can come in and view those. So create online video, people consume. It's been tried a lot. It's been tried a lot, yeah. and it hasn't worked. I'm on the board of a company with the founder of University of Phoenix, and I talked to him a lot about this category, because I looked at the category in the past. Of course, there was John Bischke's company called EduFire, um, and there have been untold number of these. Yeah, it's been a lot. And when I first looked at the category, I asked, uh, you know, what University of Phoenix view on this? And not the official view, but uh, anyway, what advice I could get. And he said, the problem is when you have these kind of courses, if you want to have a subscription service, it's so easy to churn. Like you do three courses of, I don't know what, a language or economics or whatever. Mm -hmm. If there's no accreditation behind it, if there's no goal that you have to achieve, the churn rates are too high. Um, so, I yeah, don't know. You want him to do well, but you're not. Feeling. Final, I want to see him do well. I want to be proven wrong. At a million dollars in, maybe there's money to be made here. Uh, is it going to be huge? It could be the execution. It could be no one's executed on it correctly. Yet. Could be. Uh, I wish Gagan well. I really liked uh, Gagan, and I spent some time looking. Not, I didn't look at the investment, but looking at the product uh, very early on. Etsy raised money this week. Um, and they uh, had previously raised $27 million in January 2008. They've raised $51.6 million in total. This was a $20 million round at a, you ready for it? <coughs> wow. I need a drum roll, like you're the music guy. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's, uh, my eyes are popping out of my head. Didn't know that. $300 million valuation by Index Ventures. Danny Reimer will be a board observer. Wow. Um, Axel is on the board. I think it's Keith Beyer, maybe. Yep. <coughs> Fred Wilson is on the board here. Etsy has captured the zeitgeist and market for people who want to sell artisan goods. Um, it's not like big scale industrial. It's high craftsmanship. You can, I think, even go out and uh, ask for stuff on spec to be produced. Beautiful site. Etsy's great. I like Etsy, too. Um, gross revenues are estimated at $400 million. Net revenue at $300 million. Sorry, at 30 to $50 million. I don't know where those figures come from, but you know, gross revenue is the value of goods sold. So Zappos, for example, when they sold to Amazon, was doing gross merchandise revenue of a billion dollars. So if these guys really are doing $400 million, that bodes well. Uh, that said, it's a very hefty valuation. Big valuation. Lot, lot to live up to in the, yeah. the next round or exit. That's the only comment I can make for that. So I guess we've run our course. Yep. We'll, we'll save somebody else to talk about the big news of uh, Apple's ITV <laughs> announcement for today. But yep. I've got lots of thoughts on that. Maybe I'll pick up next week. Uh, sorry we didn't get to more questions. Hopefully we got a few of them. And I uh, hope you'll turn in again next week. The next two weeks, for what it's worth, uh, we have two very interesting people. We have uh, Michael Brill, who built just a company I just love called Crush Pad Wine, mass customization of high quality wine. And the second uh, week beyond that, uh, right now we have scheduled uh, the founder of Red Beacon. Oh, great company, yeah. TechCrunch 50 company. TechCrunch 50, at yep. one TechCrunch 50, it's Ethan Anderson, the CEO. Uh, prior to that was with Google. So very thanks good. for tuning in.